the reality of the genocide of Azerbaijani people. R. A. Mehtiev, Baku, 2000. Edited by Fatma Abdullahzadeh. Scientific truth about the January 20th massacre. Prefaced the reality of the genocide of Azerbaijani people by R. A. Mehtiev. Until now, there has been a lot of articles, books and photo materials about the 20th of January massacre. I too wrote and made various reports about that horrible crime. Nonetheless, time goes by. Ten years have already passed since that event. This blatant crime committed in Baku and provinces of Azerbaijan on the 20th of January 1990, according to instructions of the Bucha of Azerbaijani people Mikhail Garbachev, will be stamped in my memory forever. On January 20, 1990, the Soviet regime perpetrated premediated carnage against the Azerbaijani nation. It was an unprecedented event. The state used arms against its own citizens, unarmed civilians, including children, women and old people. The population, who stood up against secession of the part of their motherland, Nagorno-Karabakh, was brutally punished. The capital of Azerbaijan and other regions were covered with blood. A few days before perpetration of this horrible crime, a special propaganda machine of the State Security Committee KGB, was put into action and urgent special measures were taken. Hospitals were vacated, families of Russian officers living in Azerbaijan were evacuated. Russian population of Azerbaijan left the country. Artificial Russian refugees problem was created. Authorities, through mass media, deceived the population that no troops would enter Baku. A few hours before the carnage, the power-generating block of the Azerbaijani state television was blown up by the Russian militaries. Communications net inside and outside the Republic was shut down. And suddenly, on the night of the 20th of January, different kinds of Russian troops entered the capital under the direct command of the force ministers Yazov, Bakatin and Kruchkov in accordance with Gorbachev's instruction. The crime committed by communistic dictatorship against Azerbaijan in 1990 was similar to those perpetrated against Hungary in 1956, Czechoslovakia in 1968 and Afghanistan in 1979. However, in Azerbaijan that crime differs from the others. The difference is that professional punitive squads detached to Azerbaijan included Armenian soldiers mobilized in Stavropol, Krasnodar, Rostov and other provinces of Russia, as well as Armenians served in Soviet military units in Azerbaijan and even Armenian cadets. Thus, Russian Empire's rich historical experience of a creation of national conflicts and carnage were taken into consideration again during the perpetration of the 20th of January Bloody Massacre. Soviet occupation troops also implemented some tactical innovations during the Baku carnage. In all directions of attacks accompanied by armored troops, power supply was shut down. Confused population was fired upon under the floodlight of the armored vehicles. Masked detachments turned into brutal militaries and machine gun children, women, old people, physicians, ambulances, civilians overlooking from their windows and balconies and even hospitals. Injured were shot to death to cover up traces of the grave crime. The massacre was continued till the morning. Only the next day a state of emergency was declared. By the time when the decree was announced through a military radio station, the punitive squads had already completed their bloody mission and were hastily withdrawn from Baku and thereafter new regular troops entered the capital. The population was prohibited to go into the streets so as to cover traces of the crime. Artificial skirmish was feigned to prove armed resistance against Russian troops. Stunned, shocked civilians who went into streets to look for perished, injured and missing relatives were shot down. 
Unfortunately, some questions concerned with history and socio-political roots of the event haven't been completely revealed up to date. What is more, the World Society wasn't truthfully informed about the 20th of January massacre. It was misinformed. The course of the events and their causes were distorted. A well-known Azerbaijani scientist, philosophy doctor R.A. Mehdiev's book the reality of the genocide of Azerbaijani people is of great significance for faithful elucidation of the 20th of January massacre. Undoubtedly, his work is invaluable contribution to the historiography of the 20th of January tragedy. A distinguishing feature of the book is the fact that for the first time the author describes the event on the basis of deep historical scientific research as well as in the context of the world history. He investigates historical roots of the tragedy, draws important generalizations, step by step investigates the historical path led to the carnage, as well as post-carnage events and processes. In my opinion, the most important distinctions of the work to be submitted to the large sections of the world public is objectivity. He manages to keep away emotions and describe historical roots of the tragedy with composure and from the position of the conscientious scientist. R. A. Mehdiev follows the motto, let everywhere in the world people know the truth about the 20th of January event as it is and has been realizing that goal with dignity. We should credit him for bringing up the questions why the Baku carnage was so large-scale and blatant in contrast to those committed in Tbilisi in 1989 and Vilnius in 1991? Why did the perpetrator of these crimes, M. Gorbachev, apologize to Georgian and Lithuanian nations, but didn't do that in regard to the Azerbaijani people? The author connects this with three main factors – religious, Islamic factor, Caucasian and Turkic. It should be noted that our Mehdiev appealed to numerous sources, important documents and literature. Real historical processes have demonstrated that R. A. Mehdiev isn't mistaken in his research. History of Tsarism's bloody colonial winnings testifies that expanding from Europe towards the East, the Russian colonialists in the 16th century occupied the Volga Basin Turkic Khanates, Kazan, and Astrakhan and enlarged their conquests in two directions, to the east and south. Turkic Altai nations of the monotheistic Siberia and Far East were subjugated with comparative ease. Thus, shortly after this, the Russians reached the Pacific Ocean coast. Hundreds of peoples, ethnic groups and cultures were uprooted. Orthodoxianization and Russification policy reached a great success in the shortest term. However, the Islamic Turkic unity put serious obstacles in the way of the Russian conquerors. Russia's policy of gaining outlet to warm seas by occupying the Caucasus and Iran remained unresolved. Thus, the bloody war of the Russian Empire against Islamic Turkic peoples was launched. The Tsar's colonialists took the most inexorable position towards Azerbaijan. They developed ideas to remove Azerbaijani Turks from the South Caucasus ethnic political map and Christianize the whole territory. At the beginning of the 19th century, the Russian conquerors started lingering wars with Iran and Turkey and launched carnage of the Azerbaijani people on the one hand and mass settlement of Armenians from Iran and Ottoman empires to Azerbaijan on the other hand. As a result of such policy, the demographic situation of two Azerbaijani provinces, Iravan and Nakhchivan Khanats, changed and the whole territory were Christianized at the expense of settled Armenians. Soon after the division of Azerbaijan between Russia and Iran in 1813 and 1828, the Armenian province was created on the Western Azerbaijani territories. Thus, the ground of the modern Armenian state in the South Caucasus was established. Russia succeeded in separation of Azerbaijan from Turkey and turning Armenians into political tool in her anti-Turkey struggle. Besides, Russia created hearth of ethnic conflicts and confrontations in the South Caucasus. 
This was beginning of Russia's policy to liquidate Azerbaijani nation adjacent to two Islamic states, Iran and Turkey, and to Christianize the whole territory. The Karabakh Khanate, together with the Irevan and Nakhchivan Khanates, was undergone the Christianization, meaning Armenianization policy. The Tsarism carried out the bloodiest and dirtiest variant of the divide. The Tsarism carried out the bloodiest and dirtiest variant of the divide and conquer policy in the South Caucasus. Armenian bandits, armed and supported by Russia on the one hand, and Russian conquerors on the other hand annihilated Azerbaijanians, including Anadolu Turks, under the pretext of struggle against pan-Islamism and pan-Turkism. With great success, imperial butchers were always making use of Armenians' dream to create Great Armenia State. Alliances between Russian pro-empire and chauvinist circles and Armenian nationalists dreaming about Great Armenia were always at the heart of perpetrating of genocide against Azerbaijan since Russia stepped into the South Caucasus, including 1905-1907 carnage, 1918 March tragedy, all bloody repression of the Soviet period, the 20th of January tragedy, Khojoli massacre and even still remained unsettled Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. I think R.A. Mehdiev succeeded in demonstrating the naked truth of the bloody policy on the both historical and modern background, as well as on the basis of concrete facts and strict scientific conclusions. Thus, for the first time history of the 20th of January carnage, its socio-political roots, including events and processes that caused the 20th of January tragedy, have been objectively elucidated from the scientific point of view in R. A. Mehdiev's book The Reality of the Genocide of Azerbaijani People. There is a number of other aspects of the January 20th crime. Azerbaijan leadership's treacherous position at that time, Kremlin's open support to and protection of Armenian separatists of Nagorno-Karabakh, information war against the Azerbaijani people, pro-Russian stand of the Western states and the US, stimulation of the Armenian diasporas and chauvinists' activity and other details were skillfully uncovered in this work. The most valuable and urgent conclusion of the book is to objectively and professionally inform the world society about Azerbaijani truth and to create unbiased and faithful public opinion regarding processes taking place in the Republic, using wide opportunities of mass media, state bodies and public organizations. It is important in order to prevent a recurrence of the Black January. Thereby. Philosophy doctor R. A. Mehdiev's work, The Reality of the Genocide of Azerbaijani People, might be considered as his well-founded charge against initiators of the bloody crime committed against Azerbaijani people and in author's words, per se, against the whole humanity. Charges of the International Court of Justice are awaiting them, like the Nuremberg process. Yagub Mikhailoglu Mahmudov Honored worker of the Science of Azerbaijani Republic, Doctor of Historical Sciences, Professor. Introduction No power on earth rouses our indignation at the deepest frame of our moral feelings, so as cruelty does. We can forgive any other crime but cruelty. Arthur Schopenhauer on the 20th of January 1990, a criminal military action was perpetrated against the Azeri people. Soviet military units entered Baku and other regions of the Republic to punish peaceful civilians, who took to the street as a token of protest against attempts to violate the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, against unfair and biased policy pursued by the USSR leadership towards the Azeri people. The Soviets were aided by the treacherous policy of the local leaders. As a result of punitive measures taken with incredible cruelty, 137 people were murdered and 612 injured. Within the past 10 years, inside and outside of the Republic of Azerbaijan, a great deal of books, articles and analytical researches was published. 
where the authors try to describe the events of the 20th of January 1990 in order to uncover the real reasons of this barbarian action, clear up the role of the persons involved in these bloody events in the center and in the Republic. Nevertheless, the more we chronologically move away from January 1990 and more actual materials about these events are being assembled, the more questions appear and it becomes more necessary to return back to them in order to disclose the sources of this carnage and learn lessons for future generations. The Bloody Tragedy the illegal deployment of Soviet troops in the capital and some regions of the Republic of Azerbaijan on the 20th of January 1990, extirpation of peaceful people, became an extremely bloody act perpetrated by a totalitarian regime, which was an outrage against humanity. Investigation of the similar crimes, revelation of their reasons, outcomes, promulgation of their initiators' names, haven't a statute of limitations, and all these actions ought to be a caution against the recurrence of vandalism and genocide. It is well known that in virtue of the decision of the International Tribunal, Nuremberg 1945-46, being famous in the history as Nuremberg Trial, Supreme Statesmen and the military of Germany were accused of the organization and realization of a plot against the world and humanity, extirpation of the civilians and maltreatment, plunder of communal ownership and public domain, etc. That is why Nazi criminals of all ranks are still revealed and prosecuted by state bodies and public movements throughout the world. The Nuremberg process is the first international court which recognized genocide as a very grave felony. Actions of the leadership of USSR and Azerbaijan and of Soviet military contingent, which invaded Azerbaijan in January 1990, have all signs deplored by the Nuremberg process. That is why all the culprits of the January 20th tragedy must pay for their deeds. The aggression of the Soviet military units against Azerbaijan and massive inhuman shooting of civilians became not only a symptom of the collapse of the finally rotten Soviet regime, but also evidence of the implementation of the old purposeful policy left by Tsarism of expulsion of Azeris from their historical residences. It was a policy which was thoroughly concealed by the USSR leadership under the guise of internationalism. The public situation in Azerbaijan, requirements of the people, didn't serve as a pretext for such cruelty and vandalism. The people required stopping of slaughter and forcible expulsion of Azeris from Armenia, where they lived from time immemorial, and not let subordination of the Nagorno-Karabakh to Armenia. Moscow reacted to this faithful requirement with an incredible perfidy and frenzy. It should be noted, by the beginning of the 1990s, the Soviet regime fully dissipated its life potential, though Gorbachev and his team were intensively seeking means to extend the regime. The policy of perestroika, which too quickly failed, became a blatant display of these endeavors. Those who hold that Gorbachev was deliberately destroying the USSR with the support of the West are mistaken. These talks are nothing but gossip. So-called reformists had a task to preserve USSR within its previous borders, attaching to the Soviet socio-political and economic system more attractive features for the West. They had to vitalize a system removing its odious principles and administration forms. In other words, West socialism with a human face. Coming from this main postulate, one can assert that the January 20th tragedy has many reasons, and it has deep sources. Perestroika only accelerated their development and brought nearer the final of inevitable tragedy. Thus, what are these reasons in general outline? First, the center's aspiration to keep the Soviet Empire and communist system at any price. Second, the consolidation of power and puppet regimes in the national republics. 
Third, the biased policy of the Soviet leadership with regard to Azeri people, an effort to rehash the boundaries under the cover of demographic slogans of perestroika and in particular to violate the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. Fourth, Armenian separatism and aggression based on moral, political, financial and military economic support for the former center. Fifth, traitorous activity of Azerbaijan's leadership. Sixth, dilettantism and intrigue of those who took control of the rising people, displaying irresponsibility. But one shouldn't limit oneself to the list of the above stated sources which are basically Soviet, and factors led to the January tragedy. We reiterate that it has much deeper historical roots. Black January is just a link, and hopefully the last one, of the chain of criminal actions which were perpetrated against Azeri people since the beginning of the 19th century. The biased, unjust attitude to Azerbaijan is based on far-going geopolitical plans implemented by the Soviet leadership for many years under the ideological cover of the establishment of the international fraternity. While considering events in Almaty in 1986, Tbilisi in 1989 and Vilnius in 1991, the following questions arise. Why weren't these actions so bloody and massive? Why did Gorbachev regret and apologize to the Georgian and Lithuanian peoples for events in Tbilisi and Vilnius, but did not do so in connection with affairs in Azerbaijan? In our opinion, there were three decisive factors in January tragedy. From a historical and logical point of view, they are more substantiated than references to the desires of the center to teach and punish obstinate Azeris. The religious factor. First, it is a religious factor. Though USSR leadership tried to justify themselves, they failed to deceive the world community. It is the confession of Islam by Azeris which is one of the main reasons of Gorbachev's support to Armenians in their territorial claims. Numerous publications of the Russian press could confirm our point of view. The notorious Zori Balayan used to talk in his interviews and publications about it. Gorbachev appeared on the eve of Baku carnage with provocative statements about the efforts of establishment of Islamic State in Azerbaijan. The use of the religious factor for provocative and destructive purposes was always a tool of the Soviet system and communist ideology. While occupying the leading party post for a long time, I became a witness of the intention of the CPSU Central Committee to impose upon us an opinion as of Islamic fundamentalism was exported to Azerbaijan from neighboring Iran and that is why the leadership of the Republic was accused of inaction. High-ranking functionaries from the CPSU Central Committee used to expound the case so that Iran exerted an active influence upon the socio-political life of Azerbaijan where Islam forced out communist principles from the life and consciousness of the population. Of course, Moscow couldn't endure the Muslim danger. Nevertheless, today it steadily tries to become close friends to fundamentalist Iran. In spite of the real state of affairs, unfounded political accusations against our republic were expressed in resolutions of the Secretariat and Political Bureau of the CPSU Central Committee and all Union conferences. Some leaders of the republic were labeled nationalists. The Central Committee gave shelter to and took care of obedient people and disgraced the suspects. Actually, the crux of the problem wasn't the imaginary penetration of Islamic fundamentalism into Azerbaijan. The problem was the struggle of the Christian religion with Islam, what was traditional for Russia, and old mistrust to Muslims and non-Russians. It is not accidental that in the USSR, as it was under the Tsarist regime, great power chauvinism brought up on the ground of orthodoxy and opposing of different religions used to be glorified. Authorities were cultivating it instead of fighting it. The whole national policy was based on discrimination of the population who confessed Islam, 
and was to retard social, economic and cultural development of the republics populated with ethnic Muslims and not to allow their representatives to supreme authorities. Even if any Muslim was advanced to a prestigious post in the central ministries or departments, it wasn't a rule, it was just an exception. In short, religious belonging of Azeris determined Moscow's position to the national movement in Azerbaijan and caused an unprecedented atrocity of its suppression. The Caucasian Factor the second factor is caused by the historical interests of Russia in the region, the Caucasian factor. Catherine the Great continued to pursue expansionist policy of Peter I in order to move forward to south and gain an access to southern seas. She advanced the plan to create in the Caucasus two more Christian states, except Orthodox Georgia, politically oriented to Russia. This plan implied the rebirth of the Albanian state on the territory from the river Arax till Derbent and creation of the Armenian province in the area Erevan. In this case, persistent appeal of the Crimean Armenians with a request to create an Armenian state with the capital in Erevan was taken into account. But after conclusion of the Turkmen Child Peace Treaty, Russia gave up these intentions and decided to build only an Armenian state on the Azeri territories and next to the empire. Since the beginning of the 19th century, the tragic history of Azeri people started. Fundamental scientific research proved that the territory of modern Armenia historically belonged to Azerbaijan. The truth is that Armenians lived here in small groups, dispersed, but they were alien people and penetrated into this area from the territory of the modern Iran, Iraq, Syria and Turkey. Let's scrutinize this issue. The motherland of the initial Armenian tribes was the Balkan Peninsula. The Armenian researchers themselves wrote about it. Thus, Armenian scholar Manandian agrees with the opinion of the authoritative historians and holds that initial Armenian tribes lived in the Balkan Peninsula as far back as the first half of the second millennium BC. To Asia Minor, they came approximately at the half of the 13th century BC. After long-term wandering and mixing with different tribes, they found themselves on the Armenian plateau at the half of the first millennium BC. The great historian Diakonov writes in his famous work, The Prehistory of Armenian People, Yerevan 1968, the following. We can draw only one conclusion, namely that initial native speakers of Armenian language came to the Armenian plateau as nomadic tribes with personal holdings, who didn't experience class society. They became familiar with plateau nature and social conditions of the early class society by autochtones. At that time, autochtones didn't speak Armenian. Armenians created their state in the 6th century BC. This state covered some regions of the Armenian plateau located mainly in the middle stream of Tigris and Euphrates. In 387 AD, Armenia was divided between Iran and Byzantium. In the 14th century AD, Armenians managed to create a dwarf state in the southeast of the Mediterranean Sea, Kilikia, ruled by Rubenites. This state existed just a century. In the 15th century, the Armenian church was moved to Echmiadzin in order to create an Armenian state in the South Caucasus. Since that time, the history of the Armenian people was called the Echmiadzin period. When the question is about the Armenian history of the 16th-20th centuries, it is expounded as a history of so-called Eastern Armenia, which is the actual history of Nakhchivan, Erevan and Zangazur lands. Armenians restored their statehood in 1918 on the ruins of the Tsarist Empire. With assistance of England in the South Caucasus, on the territory of Iravan Khanet of Azerbaijan, arose the Armenian Republic. Further, her territory was extended by the strong-willed decision of the Bolshevik Moscow at the expense of Azerbaijan. 
Lacking national statehood, the Armenian Church assumed a role of uniting of all Armenians dispersed all over the world. In other words, it settled to some extent political and state issues. Monophysite persuasion, the denial of human hypostasis of God, to which sticks Armenian Gregorian Church, was declared heresy as far back as the Chalcedon Assembly, 451 AD. At the Wien Assembly of 506 AD, the Armenian Church was excommunicated from other churches and became autocephalous. A famous political scientist, Dmitry Furmanov, holds that just monophysitism promoted the rise and development of the sense of abandonment, the class A persons, the very suffering and virtue of which Armenian people opposes themselves almost to the whole world. Armenian political figure Suren Zolyan wrote, To see everyone as an enemy, to become an enemy for everyone. This is not a path, this is abyss. For the Russian Empire, such state of Armenians was more than sufficient. It isn't accidental that Peter I called out Armenians as useful fellow citizens to settlement in Russia and assured them of patronage and protection as co-religionists. See Sergei Glinka, Description of the Resettlement of Azerbaijani Armenians within Russia, 1831 edition. Objective and subjective conditions, lacking of their own state, Indoctrination of ideas of abandonment and suffering by church pastors in the consciousness of Armenians, forming images of an enemy out of Turks and generally Muslims, etc., were conductive to coinciding the age-old aspirations of Armenian church to establish a national state with colonial interests of the Russian Empire. The crux of the political deal was the following. Russia assists resettlement of Armenians from Turkey and Iran to the South Caucasus and then creates a state for Armenians at the expense of ousting of local population. Armenians, in turn, pledge themselves to be loyal ally of Russia in Caucasus, her outpost in the region. Armenians were befallen a long-expected chance to realize an age-old dream to create a state under the protection of great power. The great resettlement of Armenians by Tsarist Russia to Caucasus, particularly to Nakhchivan, Erevan and Karabakh Khanates, where Azeris had been living for ages, started after conclusion of Gulistan 1813 and Turkmenchai 1828 peace treaties between Russia and Iran. Though this truth can be a discovery for many people in the modern Russia and West, but in pre-revolutionary Russia much was written about it. These processes are described in details in the famous book by M. Shavrov, The New Threat to the Russian Matter in Transcaucasus, The Sale of Moran to Non-Russians. The Russian ambassador to Persia, Alexander Grybayedov, was zealous in the resettlement of Armenians to Azerbaijan. In his reports to the Tsarist government, he wrote, Muslims, meaning Gazeris, worry that Armenians being resettled for a while will remain in Karabakh forever. Resettlement of tens of thousands of Armenian families to Azerbaijan, basically occupation, by the Tsarist government and granting them more wider rights and privileges on the ground of religious community, comparing with the local populations, soon led to ousting of Azeris from many regions of the South Caucasus. Afterwards, this process became a gradual deportation. These processes also affected Azeris living in Georgia. The policy of cleansing of Georgia from Azeris, pursued by the Tsarist government, continued to 1917. There are numerous facts about it. People had to resort to various tricks to protect their families from repression and forcible deportation. They used to change their surnames and ethnic belonging. At present, in Georgia there are many people whose surnames are of Turkic origin – Tatarashvili, Mamedashvili, Aslanishvili, Amirejibi, etc. Policy of Azeris extrusion from Georgia was pursued in 1990s by the former president of Georgia, Democrat Zviad Gamsakhurdia as well. 
In the years of the Soviet authorities, deportation of Azeri population from the Armenian Soviet Socialist Republic became an official state policy. This policy consisted of two constituent parts. First, eviction of Azeris from historical residencies. Second, the annexation of the part of the Azerbaijani territory to the Armenian SSR. Till May 1920, the territory of the northern Azerbaijan made up more than 114,000 square meters. However, as a result of passing part of its territory to Armenia and Russia, now it amounts to 86,600 square meters, meaning the territory was cut off up to 28,000 square meters, area of the Armenian Republic 29.8 thousand square meters. The process of Armenian expansion, accompanied by deportation of Azeri population from its historical lands, lasted for the space of almost two centuries. This process is marked by the policy of genocide on ethnic grounds. Massacre, arsons, destruction and devastation of localities, national monuments, etc. Only in the 20th century, more than 2 million Azeris experienced genocide policy, pursued by official circles of Armenia and their patrons. At the end of the 20th century, Gorbachev, together with his surroundings, did everything to satisfy territorial claim of Armenians and continue policy of narrowing the territory where Azeris lived in order to further oust them. That is why, when the Supreme Council of Armenian SSR adopted a constitutional act on reunification of Armenian SSR and Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast of Azerbaijan on December 1, 1989, Moscow in no way reacted to it. The National Factor The heart of the third factor, caused the tragedy, consists in a fear of Turks as policy and mode of thinking of the leaders of the Soviet state. It has deep historical roots and is connected, first of all, with centuries-old confrontations of two empires, Ottoman and Russia. The Soviet regime, in its turn, was always afraid of the ethnic closeness between Azeris and Turks. That is why, in the 1920s and 1930s, many outstanding figures of Azerbaijan were accused of pan-Turkism and were subjected to repressions. The Soviets did everything to tear contacts and ties between two peoples. To this effect, at the end of the 30s, the Latin alphabet was replaced with Cyrillic. In the Soviet years, a secret ban was placed on Azeris making business trips to Turkey. The Turkic Bugabu was always a constituent part of the Soviet ideology and geopolicy that was promoted by Armenian lobby and pro-Armenian circles in Moscow. The foment suspicions of the USSR leaders, they spread fabrications that Azeris shouldn't be trusted in all sincerity they are with Turkey. In the years of so-called perestroika, the professional instigator Zori Balayan spoke at the headquarters of the USSR and stated Azerbaijan to be the very bridgehead from which Turkey was preparing to strike southern borders of the country. January tragedy of 1990 made clear many ulterior sides of the policy of the USSR leadership with regard to Turkic republics. During the Second World War, Stalin deported Turkic Karachais, Balkars, Crimean Tatars, Meshket Turks, along with Vainachs, Kalmyks and Germans from the Volga region. In time of perestroika, slaughter of the Meshket Turks in the Middle Asia was provoked. Let's remember events in Almata, when there was an intention to impose upon Kazakhs a Russian leader, so-called Uzbek affairs, what enabled Gdelian to defame, humiliate and use violence against the whole people. Gorbachev differed from his precursors in his open actions against the Turkic republics. That time, he threw away all legal acts and constitutional provisions. Replacing authoritative leaders of these republics, he essentially beheaded their peoples. Thus, historical and socio-political reasons and deep roots of the unfair, tendentious attitude of the Bolshevik Russia and the USSR leadership to Azerbaijan lie in the fact that all three factors, Muslim, Caucasian and Turkic, 
converged in this republic and caused the imperial policy of Moscow. This is a ground of policy of genocide, deportation of Azeris, tearing territory away from Azerbaijan and giving it to Armenia. The geopolitical aspect of January Considering the sources of the 20th of January events, it is impossible not to take into account the position of the Western states either. Let's mark right away, it wasn't in favor of Azerbaijan. Central press of USSR played a great negative role in forming the false image of events in Azerbaijan in the West. Soviet press, ruled by the CPSUCC, conducted open ideological indoctrination of the public consciousness with support of Armenian Church and ideologists of the Dashnak Sutsun party. They introduced separatism of Karabakh Armenians as a forced act of protest against humiliation and discrimination by the Azeri government during Soviet period. Emissaries of the Armenian Anschluss ideology upholders conducted wide anti-Azerbaijani campaign in the West as well. The fact that just the day after the Sumgayit events in February 1988, the Paris TV showed a film dedicated to massacre clearly staged and realized by special service bodies is a witness to the scale of ideological and information war against Azerbaijan. Formation of a negative stereotype of Azerbaijanis by the Soviet and West mass media pursued an ominous object to prepare the world public opinion to appropriateness and validity of ethnic cleansing policy against Turkic language population in the Nagorno-Karabakh autonomous region of Azerbaijan and Armenia. This was explained as a forced measure of the center. That's why somewhat the wide-ranging tragedy of the Azeri people was accompanied with listless silence in the USSR. At that time, the leading Western countries didn't even try to ascertain the truth, see into backbone of the problem. Broadly speaking, they didn't even need it. On the contrary, they supported Gorbachev in all his destructive actions. It was reckoned that because he was supporting Armenian separatism, even though indirectly, the truth is on the Armenian's part. Moreover, the West knew perfectly well that such inter-ethnic conflicts were destroying the USSR from within. This matches the interests and strategic goals of USSR's adversaries in the Cold War. At that time, they weren't geopolitically interested in a separate Azerbaijan. According to the ex-advisor to the US President on National Security Affairs, Zbigniew Brzezinski, in early 90s, US made an error. They didn't include the Caucasian region, Caucasian republics, into their sphere of interests, ignoring their main strategic importance. He emphasized, we should stress, strategic change in the US political course and opinion started in 1994. Until that time, the USA was establishing its important central strategic ties with Russia only. New independent states were considered of the lowest level from the strategic point of view. That was wrong policy. See the Azerbaijan paper from February 22, 2000. US geopolitical doctrine of these tragic days for Azerbaijan was quite different. Margaret Tatweiler, the representative of the US State Department, made a statement on behalf of the US government saying the USA did not support Azerbaijan and that's why they did not find it expedient to comment on January events. The State Department openly backed Gorbachev, believing that his efforts would lead to closing down military clashes between Armenians and Azeris. The British Ministry of Foreign Affairs made a statement declaring the situation in Azerbaijan as the internal affair of the USSR. The Italian Foreign Minister, D. Michels, stated the Baku events as USSR's domestic affair. The USSR government, in his words, had to protect its own national interests and to defend itself against radical nationalists from the People's Front of Azerbaijan. So, it is evident that USSR was able to prepare the West to certain perception of the events and prevent imposing any sanctions or condemnations of different states and international organizations in regard with the unconstitutional actions against Azerbaijan. 
Being fully assured of impunity, Gorbachev sent troops to Azerbaijan in 1990, punishing harmless civilians. The Nagorno-Karabakh problem as the forerunner of tragedy of January. Since the first day of appearance, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, artificially created by USSR in 1987, was accepted by the Azeri nation as an attempt against Azerbaijan's territorial integrity, outrage on Azeri citizens' constitutional rights. All measures taken by the USSR government and the Soviet Union Communist Party Central Committee, including the bloody Baku events, testified that there was a specific logic of this lunacy. The Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is a well-elaborated operation. The USSR Council of Ministers and the Soviet Union Communist Party Central Committee's special decision from March 1988 on social growth acceleration of the Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Region was unique in the history of the USSR. It testifies about collusion between the center and Armenian leadership. In fact, this resolution laid social and economic foundations to tear Nagorno-Karabakh from the Azerbaijan Soviet Socialistic Republic's jurisdiction. The center's next step towards a Nagorno-Karabakh withdrawal from Azerbaijan's jurisdiction was the USSR Supreme Council Presidium's decree dated January 12, 1989, on establishment of special form of management in the autonomous region. Nagorno-Karabakh's administration was entrusted to the Committee of Special Government, chaired by Volsky, representative of the center. Actually, this meant tearing Nagorno-Karabakh from Azerbaijan. Further, the USSR leadership chose the way of open massacre over the nation there to appear for the sake of territorial integrity protection and declare disagreement with unfaithful national policy. Invasion into Baku of large contingent of the Soviet Army, special destination units and internal troops of the USSR Ministry of Internal Affairs was accompanied with particular brutality and unseen atrocity. The Baku slaughter, perpetrated in order to break the nation's will and its aspiration to establish the truth and to abase its dignity and demonstrate power of the Soviet punitive machine, was a real military aggression. This is one of the bloodiest acts of terrorism, committed by the totalitarian communist regime in the 20th century, Horrible crime against the Azeri nation, against humanity and humanism. The people who committed this crime haven't been punished yet. But some time or other, guilty persons will answer before the Azeri nation and the history. Certainly, both the former leadership of the Republic, as well as Moscow, are responsible for the engagement of troops and murder of peaceful population. According to evidences of investigating bodies, the authorities deliberately acted against the nation's will, blindly fulfilling instructions from the center and not realizing what unpredictable results they would cause. According to evidences of investigating bodies, the authorities deliberately acted against the nation's will, blindly fulfilling instructions from the center and not realizing what unpredictable results they would cause. Every day, they were passing to Moscow biased information about current situation in the Republic and executing relevant instructions received from the center under strict control of emissaries of the center instead of maintaining interests of the nation and Republic. Under the critical circumstances for the Republic, its leadership displayed full inability and acted as an obedient puppet in conformity with a screenplay made by the State Security Committee SSC, and USSR's Head Intelligence Service. Witnesses testify that activities of those bodies were directed to maximal complication of the situation in the Republic, arranging provocations and diversion. For example, the 13 to 15 January pogroms in Baku, seizure of the party committees, destruction of the engineering structures on the state borders, dropping out of enterprises and organizations from subordination to state bodies, etc. All these had one purpose to destabilize the situation and substantiate implementation of establishment of constitutional order in Azerbaijan. 
person to order of the chairman of the Republican State Security Committee, Vagif Husainov, on October 7, 1987, the so-called crisis group was established, consisting of 12 officers from different committee subdivisions under the head of Vladimir Mirzoyev, chief of the 5th department. Officially, the group aimed at arrangement of purposeful work on revealing, preventing and neutralizing inimical actions of opponents, preparation of preventing information for different departments and USSR SSC. It is impossible not to perceive the stereotyped character of such a formulation, usually used by security services as a code. Investigative evidences over the crisis group prove, in fact, its activity sphere was far beyond the limits determined by the order. Provocation, explosions, arsons, murderous assaults are the imperfect list of actions the group was engaged in. An analysis of investigation return shows that the first secretary of the Communist Party of Azerbaijan Central Committee, Vazirov, implicitly executing all instructions from Moscow, was the first-hand organizer and accomplice of the grave crime perpetrated against his nation. The second secretary of the Communist Party of Azerbaijan Central Committee, Polyanichko, head of the government, Mutalibov, chief of the State Security Committee, Usainov, were direct accessories to the crime. Mamadov, secretary of the party, Baku City Committee, is politically responsible for not taking urgent measures to prevent entrance of troops to Baku and not providing population security. Other members of the CPA Central Committee Bureau and heads of law enforcement bodies carry moral and political responsibility for such a situation. Researching the main reasons of the January events, some authors try to put most of the blames of the January events on those who managed demonstrations of many thousands of people or stood in opposition to the Vazirov's regime, but not on implicit organizers and performers of that wild action. Of course, we can't entirely deny their culpability. However, we should take up behavior of the so-called square leaders in another flatness. Their responsibility has quite a different character and motive. The opposition was an embryo stage, had no clear organizational structure and program on the eve of the January events. Representatives of scientific and educational institutions, ideological institutions and bodies, that is, people unsophisticated in policy, headed the demonstrations. Some of them took part in all national acts of protest in all sincerity, and others in accordance with considerations of the moment. So, what kind of role and place took the opposition in perpetration of the January events? Since mid-88, the wide masses were realizing that Azeri leadership did not display resoluteness for suppression of encroachment on the Republic's territorial integrity and, in fact, took part in carrying out of collusive, treacherous plans against citizens of the country and, moreover, they would not stop at anything to stifle the popular uprising. Under hopeless situation, the people stood up for protection of the Republic's honor and dignity themselves, against tearing away its territory against beating and violent eviction of Azerbaijanians living in Armenia. Unfortunately, the National Liberation Movement could not remain too long without common leading kernel. That is why, just at that time, before the masses, appeared imposters, whose role was not indifferent in further events. Documents and materials over the opposition groups and different persons' activities during the pre-January tragedy, as well as the 9th to the 20th of January, testify. On the whole, the opposition carries political and moral responsibility for this bloody tragedy. Nevertheless, we should take into account the fact that those groups included instigators, different carpet beggars ambitious persons not realizing sharpness of artificial situation and seriousness of Moscow's intentions, challenged people to go into the streets to put up resistance to Soviet troops. They have blood of innocent people on their conscience. After all, there were examples of ruthless annihilation of peaceful population in other republics, to which Moscow was more loyal than to Azerbaijan. 
Abul Fazaliyev, Isa Gambarov, Etibar Mamadov, Nemet Panahov, Rahim Gaziev, and others are responsible politically and morally for the 20th of January tragedy. Having a desire to be the leaders of the National Liberation Movement, they had to realize the possible tragic results of sending unarmed people against troops, as well as the responsibility for the people's destinies and lives. Unfortunately, the course of events showed they were not able to forecast further development of the situation. Evaluating degree of responsibility of pro-opposition groups for the January tragedy, we should take into account their goals and programs, level and character of organizational structure, intellectual potential, overall level of political training of peoples embodied in those groups, their world outlook, activity experience at state establishments and life experience on the whole. Alas, populism, political immaturity, ambitions, unreasonable self-sufficiency, changed into embarrassment, led to the fact that people were once again terribly deceived. In the face of historical reality First of all, it should be noted that the history of Azerbaijan in 19th-20th centuries demands a thorough knowledge of the past a profound recognition of the cause and effect relationship of clashes into the tragedy, knowledge of laws of public evolution and periodicity of stages of people's struggle for liberty. Azerbaijan has never seen such a wide-ranging people's movement like one which took place at the end of 80s, on the eve of the January tragedy. This was a really massive national movement, Restoration of violated constitutional rights of the people, maintenance of the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan made up ideological bases and slogans of the movement. Soon after the January tragedy, when the people lost their hope for faithful settlement of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, as well as their belief in the central power in the face of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the CPSU, when it was assured that the Azerbaijanian genocide was carried out with Moscow's assistance, namely by Gorbachev and his team, this movement transferred into the National Liberation One. The people realized their historical destination. It was the decree of the fate for them to settle the national problems by themselves. January 1990 is a burst abscess testifying about incurable pain covered all sections of the Soviet society. This was a premonition of collapse of the Soviet political and economic system, full failure of rebuilding perestroika policy directed to resuscitation of the socialism under new conditions. The January events discovered the whole precipice between people and government of Azerbaijan, unmasked treacherous essence of Vazirov's, Mutalibov's and Hussein's activities. Appeals of Vazirov, Mutalibov and chair of the Republican SSC Husseinov to Moscow made since the end of 1989 till the January tragedy with requests to send troops to Azerbaijan for keeping order and protecting the state institutions are confirmation of the above stated opinion. We should realize that misfortunes in the history of Azeri people were always caused by the political elite's aspiration to arrange society's life and establish an independent state without having clear fixed conception on national priorities. Very often, all national notions were substituted for false patriotism, subjective reasons and personal ambitions. Graphic demonstration of that are the bloody 1990s January and other dramatic events of the modern history, namely Ganja Rebellion of 1993 that nearly led to civil war in the Republic, coup d'etat attempts in October 1994 and March 1995, prepared acts of terrorism against the head of the state, etc. January 1990 revealed jeopardy of a policy pursued by the radical opposition wing, led that time by the People's Front as well as amorphous character of the opposition's democratic wing, which should carry constructive principles. At present, it becomes quite clear, at that time, there was not any unbroken political force able to head the national movement in the Republic. 
There was not even any national leader whose government skills, political perspicacity and wisdom could direct the vigor of national movement into the necessary turn and allow to reach goals without victims and bloodshed. Heydar Aliyev possesses all these virtues in full measures. People always perceive him as a skilled and reliable leader. Unfortunately, he was under the Union leadership's control and pursued by secret services in Moscow. All his actions were blocked. In addition, Vazirov and his surroundings, together with mafia groups in Azerbaijan, went all length, including any kind of provocation and insinuation, to bar Heydar Aliyev's returning to the Republic. In that way, populism and irresponsibility of self-styled leaders, political inexperience of persons promoted to historical proscenia by circumstances, played an ominous role in the upcoming tragedy. Their inconsequence and flirt with authorities and secret services predetermined tragic fate of the national movement as well as its destiny on the whole. The most ambitious part of the arising oppositions, without calculating the force of their influence, spurned competent representatives of the scientific and creative intelligentsia and political elite from the movement at that key moment. That was the fatal error adversely affecting further political destiny of opposition. Substitution of democratic values with Bolshevistic slogans and methods of struggle, duplicity and intrigue, intolerance and recurrences of totalitarian mentality, intellectual poverty and lack of modern ideas matching the time are the moral and political environment of arising of the opposition. That is typical for the irreconcilable opposition of today's political life. Impulse of possessing at any price the power over the people obtained at the beginning of the national movement still defined the activity of the radical opposition. It does not want to accept that not all methods of struggle formed in the 1980s and early 1990s were justified by real processes taking place in the country today. Confrontational methods are anachronism and they evidence about lack of political foresight and immaturity, lack of information about real interests of the people under conditions of creating independent, democratic state when stability has been established, when the law, parliament and press are regulating state's activity. The historical lessons of January The January tragedy went down in our memories as a mournful event, but at the same time as a peak of selflessness and heroism of the Azeri people. Though it suffered irreplaceable losses at the end of the century, the Azeri nation can be proud that in those days of ordeal it showed exclusive will, firmness, courage and staunchness of the national spirit. It proved to the world that it could go all length to ascertain justice and protect its dignity. Our people morally rose higher and added new glorious pages to its heroic history. The January tragedy became a turning point on the way to obtaining independence of Azerbaijan. Passing it, the people realized with the past life, semi-colonial subsistence was done away with forever. The national liberation movement turned into a political reality and found an irreversible character. Deep comprehension and research of different aspects of the January tragedy is of a great significance for development of state-making processes. This tragedy should be known and kept in mind in details in order to be able to get over the thorny path of establishing and developing of the independent and sovereign Azerbaijan. Everybody should realize the truth that state policy must meet the interests of the nation and rest on its support. Only under such conditions we will avoid new victims. Historical experience of those tragic days shows Stability in the country, consolidation of people, unity of citizens under a common national idea are necessary for prevention of provocations and incitements directed against independence and establishment of a legal democratic state.
Political struggle must be conducted in conformity with constitutional requirements within the framework of legal regulations. The end of 80s and beginning of 90s demonstrated that historical forgetfulness is fraught with serious consequences, creates insuperable bars to resolution of a matter of life and death. The lessons of Azerbaijan's history should be taken into account in order not to repeat errors that often causes tragedy. This will more effectively bring up the rising generation in the spirit of patriotism and citizenship, endow them with capability to take into account real demands and reckon with peculiarities of the concrete political moment. Another important lesson elicited from the January tragedy is the fact that we are assured of the fact that the world society is uninformed about Azerbaijan. Unfortunately, we yet have not been able to create quite a powerful organized diaspora abroad to form a strong lobby, national communities, which can stand up our interests in CIS, Eastern and Western countries. This is all national task to be settled and is still actual. Using the wide possibilities of mass media, state bodies and public organizations, we have to operatively and the most important, professionally spread information about Azerbaijan throughout the world, telling the truth about our republic, forming objective and unprejudiced public opinion about processes taking place here. This is a great importance so as to avoid a repetition of Black January.